about uh, about operating even if you do not have negative pressure as we are not planning to operate covid positive uh, unfortunately in this country uh, every anybody who is uh, arrested by the police and goes to the court needs to have a covid test but then in the hospitals we cannot insist on covid test so what do we do in this kind of practice uh, so these are the guidelines came from uh, poland uh, in a recent paper and uh, now we'll listen to dr kishore also uh, the the they summarize that if if the patient has no symptoms and even if the covid test is negative or pending or we cannot do we can do with standard practice like doing what we do for an hiv kit but then if the symptoms are present and if the covid is positive or negative irrespective of that one has to take precautions like we are operating in covid patients so and most of our patients will be in this group so this group we operate in our normal hospitals and this group has to be referred to the covid uh, hospital or the covid unit of your hospital so in a standard thing the, if you look at this what we need is what we regularly use for a hiv kit it's only when it's a covid high risk patient we need a one piece biological protection suit or surgical gown so one need not be very afraid of treating patients so now we should start uh, triaging our patients and treat uh, and and do not uh, send away the patients which really are urgent and emergency but it's important that we take informed consent from the patient that they can have uh, that there will be higher risk of surgery because of the covid situation the other thing uh, is air conditioner one need not have a negative pressure air conditioner for treating low risk patients a positive laminar flow air pressure is enough because if 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 our the the theater is uh, is converted to negative pressure sometimes it can be risky because you uh, because the air from the corridors or the ventilator shaft may go into the theater and can cause more problems so in our setup probably it is better to operate in a laminar flow positive pressure in non covid situations not do we expect from this uh, webinar is what do we do if you look at low grade glioma the present concept is do early surgery but then the old concept is observed if you do a pituitary the present concept is do transnas transnas transpinoidal either endoscopic or microscopic the old concept is transcranial and if you have a bad sh or a bad head injury or a cerebrovascular accident the present concept is aggressive icu management with emergency monitors with <coughs> the whole concept is medical management but in this covid pandemic what is recommended is to go back to the old concepts rather than the new concept but then which dr kishore and dr saurabh sinha and dr lee will highlight how to manage uh, manage in the present situation with this few questions i'll request dr kishore saudhri to start his uh, start his lecture please use the question and answer box for asking questions do not use chat box uh, for asking questions and answers as it's difficult to retrieve later to send an email to answer and please always write your name and place whenever you use the question and answer box uh, thank you thank you uh, i thank all the faculty and the panelists for participating and all the audience who have spent their time in participating uh, with this i request dr kishore choudhury to start off his uh, lecture dr sriram can you uh, change over to dr kishore choudhury dr kishore can you please share your screen yeah Sorry. can you see it okay yeah the first slide this is the second slide i think this is first yeah this is first so good evening everyone and good evening good afternoon everyone in the uk and europe um thank you very much manas for this invitation i think before i start i'll just start by paying my respects and tributes to the people our nhs colleagues uh, more than 100 of them now who have died to covid 19 usually when whenever i have given any talk or any uh, any presentation in my career it's either been some evidence based or with some personal experience of a series or based on regional or national databases or doing our audit and clinical clinical governance processes 
as far as this particular presentation is concerned, I can assure you that I have had none of them because in my whole career, I have never faced a situation like this. This is completely unprecedented. But there have been a lot of questions being asked by nurses, patients, GPs, that uh, these are probably myths and there is no evidence that coronavirus infection can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is no evidence that it leads to formation of mycotic aneurysms. And of course, it does not affect any re-bleed rates in ruptured aneurysms as far as we know. <clears throat> but what we do know is concurrent COVID-19 inf infection has the potential to inflict significant collateral morbidity and mortality in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, especially in vulnerable group of patients. And these are through its own respiratory, thromboembolic, and hematological complications that we are aware. Just to give a bit of background, this slide is about a, a couple of days old. We've had in last five, six weeks, about 26,000 deaths in the UK and about 171,000 cases confirmed with COVID-19. That amounts to almost 16% of mortality in diagnosed confirmed COVID-19 cases. And this is a bit scary graph. If you see the, the gray, light gray graph, that is weekly mortality in the first quarter of every year, uh, which is around 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 12,000 per year, uh, per, per week. Uh, but if you see this year, the red graph shows that in March and April, the mortality has almost doubled uh, as compared to what has been the uh, UK national average. Another thing that is very relevant to our practice of subarachnoid hemorrhage is the mortality rate by age. If you see almost quarter of the patients are above 70% of uh, age are in the mortality group. This is uh, the stats provided by a hospital yesterday. And this shows the COVID-19 positive inpatients that we have in the hospital uh, yesterday. And you can see that the, the graph is slightly plateaued off, but it's not gone down yet. We still have more than 150 patient inpatients currently, out of which almost 10% are still in the intensive care unit. This starts is as of yesterday evening, we got 163 patients as inpatients out of almost 1900 beds that we have. 24 have been in critical care. We've had 1006 COVID cases admitted and 2005 deaths. So almost in among all the admitted patients or inpatients, we've had a quarter of the patients who die. In Sheffield, we have got about 70,000, 17,000 staff, uh, about 33,500 staff tested. We had a screening a day before yesterday where we found that 1.5% of asymptomatic staff was positive for COVID. About 1,900 staff are absent through sickness. That's almost 12% of our staff. And these are 8% are related to COVID illness. So you can imagine how much impact that is, has in our tertiary referral center and also on our practices. So with this background, I can tell you that as of 23rd of March, any or most elective unruptured aneurysms, uh, the treatment has been put on hold. And that holds the same thing is true for the AVMs. We are not treating any elective AVMs. And we don't know when we're going to start that yet. They just all been put on hold. There are four reasons which are pretty simple. We need to protect the patients from contacting corona in the hospital setting, which is probably the culture medium for the, uh, for the virus. Then we need to protect us and the staff from catching COVID from asymptomatic patients. And we need to maintain our hospital inpatient capacity for the COVID-19 patients. The last thing we want is being overwhelmed by the patients and have nowhere to go. And we want to ring fence our manpower and our material resources, such as PPE for the needy patients who require them. The anesthetist colleagues have provided this slide to me where uh, everything that we normally do and we don't even notice is an aerosol generating procedure. That includes tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, uh, CPAP, mask ventilation, disconnection from ventilation, extubation, bronchoscopy, and even tracheal section in an open unit. So everything that we do, which was relatively very minor and day-to-day -day thing, now has suddenly become significant. Coming back to the subject today, which is the principles of subarachnoid hemorrhage management. 
first of all if it's possible it's ideal to test all in patients on admission for this test we did not have that facility we only started that since last one week if that facility is not available or if the intervention cannot wait till we get the test result it is probably prudent that all intervention take precautions as if the patient is covid positive and that's what we've been doing for last one month uh i think probably saurabh sina probably will go more over how the the principles are doffing and donning but if you can see there are three zones where we scrub is a green zone then there's a interim a yellow zone and there is the the patient's red zone where uh, and this is a one way traffic but probably we'll extra uh, explain that a bit later coming back to the essence patients how it has affected our practice patient selection has been mostly affected we have revisited our policy of grade 4 and 5 subarachnoid hemorrhage patients in sheffield we got an excellent itu facility intensive sub intensivist support excellent hdu facilities and uh, we are very aggressive in managing grade 4 and 5 patients with reasonably good results but now we are careful in selecting what we get through the doors same thing with elderly subgroup normally in when in last year we have been treating patients who are 80 83 85 years old because they are in such good health and their life expectancy is expected to be more than 100 but that we are now more careful as well and those with pre existing medical condition mainly respiratory which most of our patients have because of smoking again we have to treat every patients select every patient individually and weigh the pros and cons of offering treatment essentially when the patient is in we need to minimize patient's contact with the staff with the relatives or with our equipment and this includes again everything that we normally do and never take a notice of it for example repeated neurological observations uh bedside non invasive procedures such as transcranial dopplers changes of dressings parenteral administration of drugs repeated blood and csf sampling which we don't even uh take into cognizance from a neurosurgical perspective i think it is important to minimize uh the number of interventions per patient i'll go over clipping or coiling a bit later but uh, repeated lps or preferably a lumbar or evd uh shall we change the evd after a week or two or not shall we insert an esogastric tube or go for a peg such such questions but coming to neurosurgical aspect or technical aspects i think uh this is again a slide given by anesthetists that when they intubate the patient only uh, required number of personnel as shown in the diagram are need, need to be there in the theater red zone uh, and yellow zone and rest everyone stays out for clipping versus coiling our preference is for clipping whenever possible especially in this environment whenever we coil the patients almost always we consent them for both coiling and clipping under the same anesthesia so for some reason coiling is not possible because of access or unsuccessful or unsatisfactory or as a complication we do not extubate the patient or keep them ventilated we take them to theater the same way uh, and the same anesthesia also we are a bit we got low threshold for accepting suboptimal coiling because we are we can monitor it and we can revisit it later and a general principle that i often follow is that if we can't beat the natural history of subarachnoid hemorrhage is better to err on the conservative side for us there are a number of aerosol generation procedures that we need to be careful of what choice of craniotomy again we'll go through it in a minute what drill do we use how do we remove sphenoid clinoid etc and how do we use what drill and how do we use it so my preference for all elective aneurysms and number of acute aneurysms have been supraorbital craniotomy if you see this is in a pre covid era uh, covid era this uh, photograph taken if you see i only do about 1 and 1/2 inch um incision and that too stops medially at the supraorbital foramen but even then if you see in the c slide in the third slide the white arrow even then in a normal individual i expose the frontal air sinus and that's quite a big exposure so since then i do not think i can do a supraorbital craniotomy safely without exposing the frontal air sinus and therefore the value of this excellent approach now is to be questioned instead 
we can do a slightly more temporal approach and go into directly over the sylvian fissure. For example, the type one type of craniotomy that you see, which is mainly centered over the sylvian fissure, probably avoids any exposure, potential exposure to the front of the front layer sinus. Technically speaking, once you have the craniotomy, there are a few principles that we all follow, but these are probably more important than ever. Intraoperative rupture, in my opinion, is always an avoidable technical complication. It's a technical error of surgery, it should never happen, it happens. If we are in difficulty, I think we need to anticipate the difficult, anticipate difficulty and seek help beforehand. I am a keen trainer and I know one of our fellows who is with us at the moment is, is listening to this uh, webinar. And I'm very, very keen uh, to train people for aneurysm surgery. Unfortunately, probably this is not the suitable time to train registrars or fellows, and which is a very sad thing. Another thing is always try to undertake procedures in one sitting. For example, do we, will the patient need an EVD afterwards? Then insert it during the craniotomy. Are you going to take the bone flap out? If that is, do not take the patient again to theater, take the bone flap out. So number of things, and some people like to put in a, insert an ICP monitor, I don't, but if you're going to do that, instead of doing that later, do that at the same time of uh, craniotomy. And one thing I always follow, and in this case is even more so, that I like to clear all the cisternal parenchymal and in one intraventricular blood, almost always, because lesser the blood, quicker the recovery, less the spasm. As far as perioperative care is concerned, I think for obvious reason in COVID-19 patients or potential COVID-19 patients, we want to avoid hypervolumia. So it's no more triple H, it's only double H. Uh, because of the thromboembolic complications, I think it's, it's prudent to put patients on low molecular heparin earlier in the course of uh, treatment. I like to avoid repeated CSF sampling and blood sampling as well, unless it's absolutely necessary. Central line or frequent peripheral lines, again, we have to tailor this to each patient's condition. I do not like to change the dressings. And I prefer sometimes that if the, 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 the craniotomy is clean, then I don't put a scalp drain after craniotomy nowadays, especially. Also, one more important is we have to increase the awareness in staff, nurses, and in relatives. As far as the post-op is concerned, we have changed our practice completely. Most of our post-op consultations are through telephone. The NHS England is setting up a video conferencing platform, which I've just signed up yesterday, that will allow us to consult patients anywhere from anywhere. Peripheral hospital and community management is extremely important. And we in the UK are quite fortunate to have excellent district hospitals and top class community management. So if the patients can be managed there, then we can reduce the footfall in, in, pay, uh, in the hospitals. And uh, especially after coiling, I'd like to defer imaging for aneurysm occlusion for a year or even later. Uh, as far as surgical flipping is concerned, we like to get an intraoperative angiogram on table so that the, the need for a post-op DSA can be decided uh, if required or and otherwise we can do away with it. For staff, it is important that all our meetings are now digital handovers. Clinic handovers and MDTs are using Microsoft Teams and Zoom. We have a WhatsApp neurovascular group where we discuss almost every patient and certainly every emergency patient. We've got universal availability of imaging through PACs or EPACs, even sitting at our home, so we can see all the scans anywhere. And important thing is we now avoid duplication of patient care. I remember in the olden days, there used to be an SHO ward round, then a registrar ward round, then an assistant professor or lecture ward round, and the boss will come and do a ward round. Not necessary anymore, only one ward round should suffice. How are we planning to reinstate our services in the post-COVID area? Frankly speaking, I don't have an answer. I have not, uh, we are not to the, uh, uh, through the peak yet, and uh, we are going to wait for the guidance from NHS England and also from our local healthcare authorities. We will have to review these cases, validate uh, regarding the need for treatment, seek second opinions wherever necessary, bring them back to MDT if required, and most importantly, give patient the choice because number of patients, especially elderly patients, will not now want to come in the hospital for treatment. They would rather say, I'll take my chances. And test for COVID before every elective procedure. 
until and unless such time comes that we have an effective vaccine or we all develop herd immunity. Uh, the second last slide, I would like to just emphasize the point on 12th of March, uh, we have self-isolation uh, policies on 16th of March, social distancing, uh, 20th of March, the schools were closed and 24th of March, lockdown measures began. And look at the infection rate. It was still four or between three and four all the time until lockdown measures began. And now it has dropped to less than one. Although that has not yet reflected in inpatient admissions or even death just yet. But this slide shows the importance of lockdown. And those who are based in India, I think it is important that you guys have done it early. So you are reaping the benefits of it. And I would, uh, I would just request all of you to continue doing the same and, uh, and follow the guidance of your local governments. Uh, these are the five precautions that we are, the government of, uh, the Department of Health in England has advised, but these are pretty standards and these are more mainly for the, all the staff and non-medical people. And that's, for, that's all from me, guys. Uh, I think uh, I'll hand over to Saurabh. Uh, from here. Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Manas, sir, we are not to you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Okay. So, uh, We'll have the question answer session at the end of all the uh, the end of the discussion of the panelist uh, lectures. And now I'll require Dr. Saurabh to speak on manage how to manage uh, transpenetral surgeries in this uh, COVID pandemic era. I request Dr. Kishore to stop sharing his screen and yeah, Dr. Saurabh's screen. Thank you very much, Manas. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, thank you to all those who are attending. I, I I'm very honoured to be asked to talk, um, especially as, as uh, Kishore has already said, because we have very little experience of this, and I kind of feel like I'm making this up as I go along. Um, right, how's this working? Um, I, I think disclosures, uh, I'm not an expert. Absolutely no doubts about that. Um, there is very little evidence base for what we're doing and everything that we're doing is changing pretty much on a daily basis. Um, the, the talk that I've put together has been brought together by personal experience and also by talking to colleagues and staff, both locally in the hospital, but also uh, nationally. And specifically, I'd just like to thank uh, Emma, Stefan, Matt and Matthew Crank, who helped with putting these slides together and done a lot of the work in Sheffield to make sure that we are safe and our patients are safe. Um, there isn't a huge amount of evidence and, and what evidence there is, is probably that there are high viral counts in nasal mucosa, that the viral load probably correlates with outcome in those who are affected and that there is a high false negative rate for viral PCR, which is part of the reason why people worry about testing. The last comment, power tools generating aerosols, is the one that is making most surgeons and theater staff anxious. But again, we don't have masses of evidence to prove whether that actually makes a difference or not. There's been a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of information and lots of people talking about things that they've picked up on social media. And certainly in the UK and maybe in the US, I'm not sure whether it's the same around the world, Twitter seems to be spreading information without actually any real basis. And one of the, the most quoted things that we saw very early on, especially by the neurosurgeons in Stanford, was the fact that endonasal surgery shouldn't be done because in China, we'd seen 14 healthcare workers be affected by one pituitary operation. And in essence, that put a moratorium on endonasal surgery in the UK for a large period of time. However, if you actually look at the surgeons who were involved in the actual case, they have subsequently published a paper to look at it in more detail. And things that they've written very specifically is that the case has been cited several times without accuracy or entirety. 
and therefore they felt obliged to report it. And if you look at their report, what they're quite clear about was the patient COVID positive affected 14 healthcare workers that were none of the theater staff. So none of the medical staff who were involved in the operation or were in theater were affected. It was staff outside theater who did not have the appropriate PPE. So actually had nothing to do with the operation itself and everything to do with PPE. So given that, we feel that actually, if we take the appropriate precautions, then there is a reasonable rationale for offering surgery to those people who need it. And one of the first things that, that we did in Sheffield was they set up a COVID theater in order to ensure that we went through things in order to minimize infection to both patient and to staff. And the, the big issue that we've done is we've divided the theater into zones. You saw very briefly on some of Kishore's pictures, him walking through zones as he was getting scrubbed. The first zone that we have is a green zone. That's the zone that we enter theater in. And at that point, we scrub and then we don our PPE. We then move into the first yellow zone, which is where we will have a member of the either anesthetic team or the circulating team who will provide support. And by support, that means that they will keep all the paper copies, they will man all the mobile phones, they will deal with all the blood samples so that nobody within a red zone, which I'll come back to, comes out into that yellow zone. At the same time, we've now switched to changing from clean shoes in the green region to putting on dirty theatre shoes in the yellow zone. From the yellow zone, one moves into the red zone, which is where the patient is. That's where the operation is going to take place. People in the red zone are not allowed to leave. And if they do so, they could only leave through yellow zone two. And yellow zone two is where you, when you're finished, you take off all your theater uh, PPE, so doffing, and then you walk out into the green zone two where you scrub and exit with your clean shoes. And it's a one way system. We go in through one route, we come out through another. This is uh, my colleague, Matt, who is, basically showing us roughly what we're doing. So here is green zone one, that's the green zone. If you're not required in theater, you do not come in. This is where you scrub. You then move into yellow zone one. And at this point, we will change our shoes. Once you're into yellow zone, yellow zone one is what allows you into red zone, which is where the patient will be. And then once you've finished your operation, you go from red zone into yellow zone two, which is where you doff all your equipment. You can see them here. And then eventually having taken all that off, you can then in, go into green zone and walk your way out of theater. From a case selection point of view, every patient that we are thinking about operating on has to go through our multidisciplinary team meeting. In actual fact, what we've set up more recently is a regional or even national panel where if I think a patient needs endoscopic endonasal surgery because it's the best route, then we will actually discuss him with other surgeons in other units. We're very fortunate that two of our most senior national neurosurgeons on the National SBNS Committee are Alistair Jenkins in Newcastle, Nick Phillips in Leeds, both of whom happen to be pituitary surgeons. And so it's very useful having very senior, sensible colleagues who actually can help you with this. We made a decision that all elective patients should be uh, delayed. We do have lot, one of the great advantages of pituitary patients is it's a benign condition, it's a slow growing tumour for it. So in the UK, many of these patients can actually be delayed and just have a repeat scan or review at three months. We've also agreed nationally that all functioning tumours should be managed medically where possible. So for Cushing's, you can start them on metyrapone on a block and replace. For acromegaly, they can be started on langreotide or octreotide or whichever poison you choose. And that pituitary surgery should only be reserved for those patients who have severe or progressive visual disease. Preoperative considerations that we considered, so all patients get tested. If the patient is positive, we would delay surgery because of the risk to staff. Um, we know that most patients, even if they've got very bad vision, can manage 
to have surgery delayed by a few days without too much uh, complication. We encourage the patients once they've been tested to self-isolate and we won't operate on patients who have COVID symptoms unless it's an absolute life-threatening emergency. From a theatre perspective, it's really important that you are present. We do a WHO brief for every, every list, and I think the brief is really important for these, in these times. What you have to consider is everything is going to take much, much longer than you're expecting. There's an, almost an extra hour in putting the patient to sleep, and there's almost an extra hour in waking the patient up at the end, and I'll discuss that very briefly in, few, in a bit. You need to think of all the potential requirements. If you even think you might need something, make sure it's in the theater at the beginning of the case. So if you are someone who occasionally uses uh, a hemostatic agent like flow seal, or occasionally uses a dural sealant like dural seal, have it in the theater and have it in the theater from the beginning, because there is no guarantee someone's going to be able to find it easily if you need it in an emergency. And the other thing to remember is it's really difficult to communicate when you've got your PPE on. It's difficult for people to hear you talking and asking. So you're constantly having to raise your voice or you need to find some method by which people can be aware that you might want to speak to them. One of the delays are because all patients need to be uh, intubated in theatre. We assume all patients are COVID positive, as Kishore has already said. And the reason for that is because in a theater, you have 25 air changes per hour. On a ward, it may be about six. In, if you have 25 air changes per hour, then after you've done an aerosol generating procedure, such as intubation, then within 10 minutes, more than 98.5% of the virus particles will have been cleared. And within 20 minutes, it's, all, it's just less than 100%. And so that means that when the patient is intubated in theater, theater staff cannot come in for at least 10 minutes, which means that there is a delay to you being able to set up trays and trolleys or to prep the patient. And you need to consider that at the beginning of the operation. You also need to consider it at the end of your operation that things are going to be delayed by 10 or 15 minutes after any AGP has been done. So if you're going to do an aerosol generating procedure and uh, Kishore has already talked about the fact that intubation, extubation, using a, a drill, going up the nose, all of these are considered red AGPs and therefore high risk, what is it we do? So minimal staff in theatre, you need to, if you're not actively involved, you should try and stay more than two metres away. You should all have PPE. And by PPE for airborne procedures, we're looking at a properly protected face mask. We're looking at a reinforced gown with long sleeves. We're looking at at least double gloving, a visor and a surgical hat. It's not pretty. I'm sorry, I don't look great in PPE. I'm not sure I look great without it either, to be fair. But you can see here the formal mask, the visor, and then the gowns. Um, from an interoperative perspective, what you need to consider is if you're going to have minimal theater staff, and Kishore has already touched on the fact that from an aneurysmal perspective, he thinks that this is not a good time to train. I think one of the things we need to consider is, well, that's fine if this is going to be short-lived. But if we're talking about precautions for months or even longer, then actually we need to consider training because otherwise we're going to be in a position where no one's going to learn how to do these. And therefore, I think we do need to think about bringing the trainees back in to do these operations because I don't think this is a short, a short period where we're going to be doing this. There's lots of evidence that, that iodine is very good at killing viruses. And whereas we would normally prep the face with COVID-19, we're now for any nasal surgery, and certainly pituitary surgery, we're going to irrigate the nose or pack the nose with uh, patties, which are already soaked in iodine. There's, very, there's some evidence, and some of my colleagues are already doing it, is the throat pack that we put in for pituitary patients are also being soaked in iodine. 
we don't normally have nasal packing that we remove. We all, we've always used dissolvable nasal packing, but if you haven't used it before, that might be a better option now so that you're not taking out nasal stents or nasal packing on a ward where they don't have as many air changes. We've always used dissolvable nasal packing, so that aspect hasn't changed for our practice. It is worth thinking about alternative surgical approaches. So does your patient have to have a transphenoidal operation? There are various other options. Uh, Kishore has already spoken very eloquently about the eyebrow craniotomy. You can see in this young boy who's had a craniopharyngioma removed that the scar heals very nicely and it's a reasonable option to use. The other option, safer perhaps, is to go back to doing microscopic transphenoidal surgery. We know that if you go transeptally and submucosal, you won't be irritating the nasal passages in the same way. You can use uh, punches to remove the septum and the vomer and you can use uh, punches and kerosens to remove the cella. Uh, and this is an approach that most of us were trained in originally and may well be an option here instead of doing endoscopic work. And then lastly, you can see that we can do this still by a formal craniotomy. It's a very nice picture there of an approach by a terional craniotomy. One of the things to consider with the microscope is that if you're going to be using it, this visor is not helpful because you can't get close enough to the eyepieces. And therefore I use these special goggles, which can go over my glasses. Sadly, I'm very blind and I have to have glasses as well. Although my, my junior staff who don't have glasses use wraparound goggles, which allows you to use a microscope as you would normally. You cannot use it properly with a visor. If you're going to do actually endoscopic endonasal surgery, and we have cases where we do have to do that, where you want to minimize the risk. And things to consider are using the microdebrider, using the co-blator and using this drill, all of which carry some extra risks uh, with aerosol generation. I'm not clear what the evidence is, but I think with everything you want to try and minimize the risk. So if it's possible to do without, you should. If you are going to do it, this is what we're uh, using. Uh, this is a plastic cover that we normally cover our keyboard with so that we can look at the imaging at the time of surgery. They're sterile, they're cheap, they're in all our theatres. And what we do is we cover the head with it and then we make little holes in order to introduce the instruments that you need and one extra hole where there's constantly a sucker that is using that is being used to suck out any aerosol within there. Difficult to know how much of a benefit it makes, but it makes us feel better and hopefully we'll be at least minimizing some of the aerosol that we're seeing. Things to think at the end of the operation is there, as I mentioned, there's a time delay at the end of any AGP. And the pituitary surgery in itself is an AGP. So if you put anything in the nose at the end of the operation, you can't just take off your PPE. You have to wait a minimum of 10 minutes to allow the particle numbers to reduce back to that number of what I said. So 10 minutes after we finish that operation before we can doff our um, gowns and leave theater. Remember, there's no paperwork in theater. So all your op notes, all your samples are going to have to go out of theater. All your forms need to be filled outside of theater. Once the patient, once we've undraped the patient, we've waited our 10 minutes, then the patient's going to be extubated. You then need to wait another 10 minutes again before the staff can take off their PPE and start disassembling all the equipment and cleaning everything down. If the patient is COVID positive, we would recover them in theater. So that means you've got another half an hour at least of the patient being in theater before they go to the wards. If they're not COVID positive, then they can go to recovery. And after that, the theater needs to be cleaned and that takes at least half an hour. So we're talking about an extra hour after your operation before you can even think about sending for the next patient. So this is just my overall thoughts for uh, endoscopy is question one, does your patient actually need the operation just now or can they wait? Because if they can wait, they should do. This whole process takes much, much longer than you think. And for a very short procedure, that extra work that you have to put in seems to make it very difficult. So a 
20 minute EVD procedure can take two hours, 20 minutes, whereas a two hour uh, pituitary operation takes an extra hour, an hour and a half and doesn't seem so bad. But you do need to think about reducing the number of patients you're putting on a list. Whereas we would normally do anywhere between three and four pituitaries, we're probably only going to manage two in a day now. PPE is really uncomfortable. And after an hour or two, you really don't want to be in it. So if you're thinking of doing a very long operation, it might be worth thinking about having a, a team so that a different surgeon comes in at a reasonable time to give you a break. And the last thing that I know, certainly noticed from a personal perspective is long cases lead to dehydration. My last uh, patient that I did was a young uh, four-year-old with a post fossa tumor. It was an eight hour operation in full PP for that whole time. By the time I'd finished, my legs hurt. I had cramp in both legs all night and struggled to sleep. And my rationale behind it is when I'm normally operating, I don't have a face mask and therefore when I get thirsty, someone gives me a drink with a straw. You can't do that with PPE on, and it's eight hours without any fluid intake whatsoever. So it's really important to think about that and maybe taking breaks and working in a team. And lastly, probably most importantly, I think, don't forget the rest of your staff. They are all really anxious and they're anxious for all sorts of reasons. Uh, some are sensible, some aren't, but they are anxious about it. Think about them think about how they're feeling. So be really careful about whether you think something needs to be done because there's lots of people involved here, not just you and not just the patient. Thank you very much. I hope you all are keeping safe and well. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Sinha. And uh, it was really nice uh, to, and may, uh, uh, to see how it can be done um, in, in the present system uh, without uh, uh, having any uh, extra gadgets and all those and uh, the idea of using a sucker and uh, and covering the uh, head while doing the endoscopy was really uh, innovative um, we'll go on to the next lecture uh, by dr uh, lee from wuhan and he'll be speaking on how they manage in wuhan and and yeah. later we'll have the mm -hmm. uh, we'll go for the discussion you may <clears throat> yeah, you okay. can see. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, wait a minute, a minute. Nice to meet you. I uh, have a uh, very glad to have a chance uh, to share uh, our experience about uh, COVID-19. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I want to share the management and the operation of your surgery department post COVID-19 period in Wuhan. Uh, my hospital is the third people's hospital of Hubei province, uh, located in Wuhan. Uh, Hubei province is a middle-sized comprehensive hospital. The characteristic of our hospital is cerebral vascular disease including neurology and the neurosurgery. In one month, just since January uh, to 2020, in one month, the only COVID-19 patient have been eliminated because there are too many uh, COVID-19 patients. And this is uh, the China, uh, the India, uh, the UK is far, far away. This is Wuhan, uh, the center of uh, China. The building, the three uh, building is our uh, is my hospital. Uh, about my department, <clears throat> we have forty beds, including five intensive care unit beds. Equipment: uh, pancho nineteen hundred operating microscope, DSA, MRI, CT, endoscope. We focus on the cerebral vascular disease, the microsurgery technique, and the interventional uh, technique. Um, maybe I will wear to some uh, tumor and uh, brain injury. The number of the LU operation is more than 300. The algorithm, clipping, uh, amortization, AVM, AVF, CA, uh, cerebral hemorrhage, brain tumor, hydrocephalus. The mean 
uh, the MD uh, with Kuna in Germany. Uh, good at um, micro neurosurgery and innovational technique uh, of cerebral vascular disease. Uh, <clears throat> uh, how about the characteristic of COVID-19? Uh, it's a, a respiratory tract infection. The people are generally suspectable, uh, highly infectious. The family agreed aggregation uh, infection is the main reason. So, and there are many mild and or asymptomatic carriers, maybe uh, half or 80% of them don't have fever. This can result in the patients and uh, his company, companions, we have COVID-19, but a lot aware of it. So we suggested that all patients who have to be have not been excluded from the nucleic acid test and the antibody test should be protected as COVID-19 pattern. The protective measures is very important. Uh, the simple measures uh, such as uh, wearing face mask or washing hands frequently and keeping social distance are effective for people without close contacting with COVID-19 patients. It's very useful. Uh, however, the doctor and the nurses is closing contact with COVID-19 patient. So it leads to improved protective measures, necessary equipment and protective awareness. Uh, for our the first step, where the whole step should be educated to suggest the protection skills and awareness to enhancing the protection confidence. Establish COVID-19 implementation and the control system is very important too. The software well, such as the daily supervision of the hospital treatment process for uh, different patients, different cases. The hardware, we establish a buffer area according to stand of the respiratory infection disease isolation area. Uh, the other important is the last protective equipment. The buffer world is uh, well, the new patients and uh, his accompanying person will complete COVID-19 screening. The screening including body temperature, a long CT, nucleic acid test, we will check twice because uh, there are four negative antibody tests, IgG and IgM. Sometimes we think the long CT is exactly and the things uh, and uh, useful. The patient who did not complete the uh, screening in time should be treated as the principal patient who is COVID-19 infection. So we take it to the barbarian and provide second level protection. And for the life threatening emergency patient, the operation and the results should be carried out actively. And the protecting level should be raising to the third or the highest level. If the uh, patient have uh, the COVID-19 levigative patient, will transfer to the general ward for further treatment and, and uh, for the first level protection. You know, in Wuhan, uh, maybe in China, uh, less pa uh, COVID-19 patient have found uh, every day. So uh, it's less than uh, an, a rupture algorithm patient. The patient with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 are transferred to designated hospitals, some hospitals in the city for further treatment, especially for the COVID-19. COVID uh, this is the guideline for China uh, details of protecting levels, the first, uh, the second, uh, the third level. 
The first level is a mask, the global wash your hands, uh, shoes. The second, we will change to the uh, K line, uh, KN line five mask, uh, goggles. The third, we will uh, wear the uh, protective suit. This is the third protection levels that I, my doctor, uh, my, in my hospital, uh, college. We have not well like this equipment. Uh, we can do everything, uh, anything in this equipment, and this equipment. This uh, operation in the negative pressure operation room is very uh, narrow on the microscope. Uh, the two doctor, Dr. B, Dr. U. The interventional room, the patient, a local and the successor. Two doctors. Now let's talk about uh, diagnosis and uh, treatment strategy about some new surgery, uh, new surgery cases. The se selected operation was postponed temporarily, but the patient were followed up closely by internet or telephone. But such as the unrupture algorithm, AVM, a symbolic cerebral stylosis, epilepsy. Uh, but the tumor and hydrocephalus uh, with an increase in your intracranial pressure of the COVID 19 negative, we will operate. Prolapse rating 30 days in emergency operation was performed, but at the end of the third, the highest level of protection. Uh, it were not without uh, waiting for the COVID line nucleic acid detection. For algorithm as such, pituitary uh, tumor stroke that affect vision, the surgery were as soon as uh, were performed as soon as possible after completing the COVID nineteen screening, and it will lead more uh, less than forty eight hours. <clears throat> The patient without the COVID-19 screening results we have to operate now, where we operate in the negative pressure operation room or catherine room. At least is a special operating room or catherine room shall be strictly under the room where the strictly disinfected after world. Uh, we use the more CTA examination because we can got the head CT, long CT image, uh, the CTA image in one time, a short time. And the DSA or MRI, uh, MRI examination only in some lessons, in some cases lessons really. Uh, we use some uh, more minimum, uh, minimal invasive operations, such as interventional treatment, durable hole and uh, catheterization but the micro surgery or open surgery were less used. And uh, this is a hematoma, this remark and the CT. We uh, use two catheter, one to four days later, the uh, hematoma clearly is clear. Uh, in the patient with the suspected occlusion of the main cerebral arteries, Intravenous cerebral lysis is the first choice because we can use it in a CT room. <coughs> Unless the indication of the interventional cerebral phagotomy have been strictly evaluated. <coughs> Sorry. The local anesthesia is often used. Uh, unless uh, if the required by the operation or by, by the surgeon. Uh, I will show some cases in the special period that we have done a hematoma uh, in the brain uh, uh, operation. In another hospital, have we, uh, the hematoma have been resected. Three days later, ray bleed. The CT algorithm here because that uh, hospital cannot open uh, 
uh, cathedral operating room. So the patient uh, was transferred to my hospital. The DSA show a fistula, drain enlarged vein, uh, drain vein aneurysm. 3D, the micro cathedral approach to the fistula site. The articles have been joined, uh, uh, injected. The fellow results disappeared, the aneurysm and the drain vein disappeared. Five years later uh, of the operation, this patient is a large internal carotid of ceramic algorithm. We can see here the cellar region. Yeah, the MRI she, uh, algorithm here, large algorithm uh, at the internal carotid artery of ceramic. This is of ceramic artery, a narrow uh, leg. We would like to use a covered stand to cover the wreck. So we perform a BOT test. We can see flow, the contrast flow from ECA to ICA. So I think we think it could be the ophthalmic archive can be occluded. This is the cover stand. The cover stand name is Willis, uh, made in China. This is the anterior uh, choroidal artery, the posterior communicating artery, the ophthalmic artery. This is the final region. Uh, ophthalmic artery disappeared, but the patient has not uh, any uh, symptom. The pituitary adenoma, pituitary, the enlargement of cell facade operation, that is the best uh, follow results. At the postoperative MRI, a large meningioma, the scar, the tumor, the very large tumor, a DGI issue, the fibro. Angiogram, we can see the occlusion of the uh, right uh, lateral cellus. We can find the enlargement supplement artery to the tumor. The uh, uh, position, the incision, the tumor. We have performed the we do use the, the, the courses 16 uh, hours. Dr. B, Dr. Chen in my department. Yeah, this is a young a male found to become consciousness for find the find the point uh, for find the uh, point nine hours. Uh, this consciousness is sleeping, complete uh, as for, uh, aphasia. The DDI issue, a large infection area. The totally occlusion of the internal carotid artery. So we have to do a decompressive craniotomy. This is a post-operation CT. <coughs> now, most of the cases we have treated in the period, in this period, as aneurysm, subarachloid hemorrhage, SAH, and this is a neurological <coughs> pulmonary edema. It is not a COVID-19. Dr. Graham say uh, algorithm, <coughs> 3D, algorithm. We use a catheter, two catheters, coil it to the follow results. This is an emergency, so I'm for acute occlusion for uh, an artery. There was only one case in this period is performed by Dr. Wan. The patient can admit to hospital with a sudden rising in the weakness, a face with unconsciousness. Unage score score is lighting. So we go to the emergency green canal. We can see MRI, MRA, 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 we can see the left internal artery occluding totally. And the DSA show the occlusion of the, uh, the internal carotid artery. We uh, take the blog with the so detail, the fellow results. 
we, uh, this is the strong dose. The post-operative uh, operation CT, the, the second day, uh, the next morning CT, the patient have lost, uh, had a clear mind and was able to answer some questions. Thank you, thank you, and the best regards to everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for uh, uh, for an exhaustive and and explanatory explanation uh, explanation of how to manage the patients and uh, in a post COVID status. Uh, uh, before I go into the questions and answer, I'd like Professor Mistra to uh, Professor Mistra to share his screen and then speak on on the SOP at Imbuja Hospital. Manas, would you like to have the question answer before SOP? Because much more important these talks rather than our SOP. We'd like to learn from them. Is that okay? Or what do you want to? Why not okay, ask these questions to the faculty? What do you want? Uh, I, have start not, with the I have some questions to this guy before. You know, we, okay. we like you can start out with the questions, sir. Dr. Deepak yeah. also you can start out with the questions. Uh, yeah. Question answer are there. You can see the question answer and then ask also. And can have your personal questions also. No, no, I have some personal questions first before you you can take off the question answer. I just want to take uh, a couple of questions uh, if you allow. You me. can start off with your question, sir, then I'll take from the yeah. audience. Yeah. So uh Dr. Saurab Sinha is there? And both to Dr. Kishore and Saurab. Are they hearing? Yes. Yeah, okay. Very nice uh, presentation. Uh, first to Saurabh, uh, uh, how, how many have you now done this uh, endonasal during this period? So we, uh, fortunately, I managed to get through most of them as we just started lockdown. So I did I think seven in about two weeks. So that's and a number. I now have three more lined up, one for this Monday and two more the Monday after. So endoscopic or uh, microscopic? All endoscopic. Sorry? All endoscopic. All endoscopic. Now, uh, I saw your PPE and your neck was not covered. You know, so th is that a concern? Because you saw the Chinese uh, presentation and our, our ID team and all that. They, this, the face and uh, the, the neck has to be covered by everything. That's what for aerosol generating procedures. Is that something of a concern or no? This is what we have. Uh, uh -huh. So far, it hasn't been a problem. Um, it seems to work, and we, we've got very few. Um, we've got a few healthcare workers that've been affected, but not not many in, in Sheffield. Um, my the other thing I do is after I finish, I literally just I, I get showered, and only then do I kind of go and see my family. Okay. The third, the last question to both of you. Uh, now this, uh, or maybe you actually, you're doing the endonasal. Uh, the, what about you said seven days, you advise the patient to, after the test to, you know, kind of a non-contaminated area or something like that. I understand some hospitals, both in China and some other countries like Israel uh, and uh, some other places, they advise admission in the hospital in a non-contaminated area for after the first test and they repeat a test, second test before, uh, after five days, and then go for surgery for endonasal or anywhere even you're opening up the mucosa. Is that, is, do you do a second test or was it only one swab? I, I, so far, I've only had one patient where I've done a second test um, and I'm not quite sure why we did. Um, but no, we, we, there, there was lots of talk about, do we admit them so that we know they're isolated, but actually they're probably at a higher risk in hospital than if they're self-isolating at home. And for most patients, if you explain to them why, I mean, we're already in lockdown here in the UK anyway, and actually patients who are needing an operation are scared. They're not wanting to put themselves at any extra risk. Uh, and those who are, have pituitary surgery, many of them are on drugs like hydrocortisone, which shouldn't actually affect them, but it does make them think it does. And so they've been pretty good about keeping themselves isolated. So we've not felt the need to bring them into hospital. And it's fine. Sure, you haven't got any interview. No, no, we I haven't. We we haven't still in our hospital. We have not started Indonesia. Yeah. Okay. We are still worried about it. And the uh, in UK, do you have a separate COVID hospital? So theater or the same hospital, different theater? What's it? 
Is so you can answer one of you anybody. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. No. Probably. Yeah. 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 No. Uh, Dr. Deepak. Uh, Dr. Deepak wanted to ask after that. Please. Sorry. We don't have a separate hospital. All our hospital in the region are uh, are accepting COVID patients. Uh, although our ITU is kind of uh, separate, the neurological ITU, which is separate from the non-COVID ITU. But if there was uh, overwhelming inflow of patients, obviously these boundaries will be blurred. And uh, the government, as you probably heard in the news, has built up 10 Nightingale hospitals, which are purely for COVID patients. So our uh, NHS trust will not be under pressure uh, to, uh, from the COVID uh, aspect. But I think uh, we have not used that capacity. I think at this moment in time, we got much more number of beds and ventilators and ITU beds available than the COVID patients. Uh, is that correct? COVID, COVID patient, have you operated a COVID patient, Kishore? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, because we didn't test them, you see. We, we only started testing them, what, about four or five days ago, last week. So whatever patients we operated, uh, they were assumed as COVID positive. positive. Did you either operate who came become positive you knew afterwards or have you operated a COVID positive patient, tested COVID positive patient by now? No, because we have not been able to do the test. Only I could say that I have you have not done. operated a known COVID positive patient till date, correct? No, because we have only what started testing. Have you COVID. operated a COVID positive, Dr. Saurabh, Sinha? No. Uh, Dr. Lee, not, you have not one, that, not one that's no, no. Yeah. What about Dr. Lee? He must have operated there many cases there. No. COVID positive, Dr. Lee, have you operated a COVID positive patient by now? I think he's, he's mute. He's muted. Microphone is mute. He needs to unmute. Can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, Dr. Lee, have you operated a COVID positive patient? Uh, I have an uh, interesting uh, experience. The, the patient have an uh, aneurysm, very clipped. Uh, before the operation, in the you know, two months ago, we have not uh, uh, nuclear, nucleic acid uh, uh, checked. So uh, the long CT have not shown early infection or early uh, or problem. We operated then uh, and clipping it, clip it. The second day, my doctor uh, doctors told me the patient the CT, long CT, she a uh, shoe is uh, like a COVID line uh, philo uh, philoma. Uh, so. Uh, but we have uh, we and the performed uh, operation in uh, legative uh, pressure operating room, uh, third level protective uh, protection. So uh, me and other doctors and other nurses have not in, uh, uh, got the bad COVID nineteen. There was only one patient. Pa uh, patient. Okay. Uh, there is one question for you from Dr. Chirag. He has asked if, if we cannot do COVID testing, uh, whether two CT scan of the lung is good enough to tell that they're COVID negative. Two CT scan of lungs done 48 hours apart. For me? Question for me? No, if we cannot, we do not have the facility of COVID testing, then if we do a CT lung, and repeat it after 48 hours, if both are normal, uh, can we take it as, as a low risk case? Uh, sorry, I have not understood your problem, your question. Manas, I will answer that question. Okay. Yeah, CT, I, I don't think you need to do two CT lung because if you are operating uh, and if there is emergency patient, that is our protocol. And this is something we are following the advice of the European uh, Association and what they're doing in Italy. So while waiting now, suppose a patient has intracerebral hemorrhage or a trauma or a, a big hematoma, we cannot wait for the, we have the swab facility in-house, but if we cannot wait for the swab result to come, we take the swab, we do a CT test, and then we go on for the surgery. 
No, it is. In, I will in, show you our SOP, which is uh, yeah, quite in our state, in uh, doing a swab test is not allowed uh, for all elective cases. So uh, yeah. then we are stuck. We can cannot do a two uh, COVID test for negative. We cannot do one itself. So well, in those I'm not, cases, I'm not talking of emergency. Talking of electives. Well, I'm not sure how much a specific specificity CT lung would have for COVID patients, especially in endemic areas where tuberculosis is rampant. No, no, no. CT lung is very, very, very insensitive. It's so, as much as the PCR test. See, yes. PCR positivity is sensitivity is seventy percent. CT chest, not only it picks up the patient, that's about it's a ninety percent sensitive. If the patient is in the infective stage, much more important. If there is a pneumonia in the CT, then the risk of patient getting damaged, the risk of uh, mortality of that patient from anesthesia is 25%. So it is better avoided. So that the CT chest is not only for finding out the, the sus suspect case, but to take a decision not to operate if there is pneumonia. Before the patient gets symptoms, there will be lung signs, lung, lung signs in the CT chest. So CT chest is very, very, uh, uh, informative and this is uh, most uh, now European the, if you talk to Spain, Spanish and Italian surgeons whom we, we had some couple of meetings with them and some uh, some uh, webinars so that has been their protocol yeah that's, that's good Dr. Deepak uh, had yeah. some comments to make hi uh, good evening everybody uh, I think we had very good presentation by all the three speakers I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Saurabh and Kishore uh, you did seven cases of uh, pituitary in the last one week. Were these elective surgeries or uh, there was an indication of uh, deterioration in the vision which uh, kind of uh, forced you to do these surgeries? Do you have some policy to operate such cases? So only operating on patients losing vision. I'm not operating on anything else. Okay. Okay. And uh, just one question to Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee, can you hear me? I think he's mute again. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I understood that you had only one case uh, who was COVID positive uh, in your hospital. But I would like to know in the whole of uh, Wuhan, uh, I'm sure there must be a lot more cases. Uh, what was the surgeon's positivity after surgery? How many surgeons uh, in, your, in your city, they actually got infected after doing surgery on these COVID positive cases? Do you have any such data? I'm talking about neurosurgery. Uh the number of the neurosurgeon? Yes. <laughs> so became positive sorry. after the surgery. Uh, sorry, I'm not. Uh, I have not have the exact uh, 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 number. Uh, maybe in the uh, in the in that case, in that special period, most uh, 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 most of the doctor, the hospital, the doctor, the equipment, the nurse are pay, uh, focused on the COVID line. So the real surgery, uh, such a we can't uh, just as, as I say, we uh, just uh, do the uh, life threatening uh, disease, the hematoma, the algorithm, uh, to select the uh, patient where a lot do it, where a lot perform the operation. Yeah. In the uh, some doctors, uh, maybe uh, including your surgeon, uh, have uh, infected the COVID nineteen, uh, but the most of them are re uh, uh, luckily re uh, recovered. Yeah. Okay. To, to continue the discussion about what about Doctor B K Mishra said just now about uh, CT uh, of the chest. I think it creates a lot of fear in the mind of the, the, the radiologist also. You know, when you send a patient for CT scan of the chest, they always have a fear that it adds to the burden and there are a lot of staff who are involved in doing the CT scan of the chest. We recently had a patient of a brain tumor who came to us, had some, uh, he was a COVID suspect and uh, it was a nightmare for us to get the CT chest. And when we got the CT chest, we were told there are some kind of kind of peripheral opacity suggestive of COVID, and there was a panic created for that patient. And finally, that patient came out to be negative. So uh, CT scan is not. I think it's more important in the patient management. I would say uh, it should not be kind of guiding you in taking a decision to make a patient COVID suspect or not. Yeah, I, I, I don't think. 
that is uh, the reasonable doubt because we have a protocol. You know, if you talk to the people who are doing CT scan, in fact, it's much more difficult to sterilize the MRI than the CT scan. CT scan, we have a protocol. I, I don't have it now, but we routinely do CT chest. And that's a standard protocol for all patients who are going for emergency surgery who cannot wait for the swab result and there is a CT scan is done. That's a standard protocol for us. And that's a standard protocol in Italy. And there's a standard protocol for European Association now. So I don't think that's something which is uh, difficult. And if you are suspecting, that's good. I mean, you have to, if you're suspecting, you have to be careful about it. So I don't think there's any problem. Uh, I'm surprised that one CT scan, you are worried about that. Yes, we do not do CT scan as a screening tool. It is done only for in patients who has to have an emergency general anesthesia. If you're doing local anesthesia, you don't need it. If you're doing an emergency general anesthesia, it's not only for you to know, but for the protection of the patient. The data is there is published data, 25% mortality in patients who have COVID in the, in the lungs in the city. That's the data which is published data. There's a question from Dr. Amir Pasha from Hyderabad. Uh, he has asked what, uh, what, is, what is the amount of aerosol with uh, drill and diathermy and does it really carry a virus? And similar question from Dr. Heman Bharatiya that uh, what is better to use a giggly saw or a craniotom for doing the craniotom? Uh, anybody can answer. Dr. Mishra, Dr. Kishore. Before we exit, I'll go there. So can let the faculty answer who are much, much more experienced with these patients. Sorry, I, I lost the question. Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, what is the risk of aerosol generation with drill and diathermy? Does it have enough of virus to cause problem? And uh, what is better to use a giggly saw or a craniotom? Oh, excellent. I think I skipped a couple of slides that, uh, that I had prepared. Uh, <clears throat> we had, there are two things. First of all, whether to use craniotom and giggly saw. Uh, if you use uh, half of our uh, consultant staff probably and most of our trainees have never seen uh, giggly saw and guide being used. Fortunately, we are uh, we have the advantage of uh, having the benefit of having used it for the first decade of our career anyway. And it's not as simple. I think using a giggly saw and guide requires a bit of skill and training. I've seen a number of surgeons using giggly saw and breaking it and not using properly. Now, of course, all of you have seen them as well. So it's not just a matter of using giggly saw and guide. So we discussed about it. We debated about it. We talked to our trainees. We have a giggly saw and guide ready in theater, but everyone probably opted to continue using uh, the craniotomes with, uh, with some precautions that there are only people who are doing the craniotomy who will stay there and people will not come in the red zone during that period after, after 10 minutes and copious and copious amount of irrigation. As far as drilling is concerned, as I said, I try my best not to avoid or to open the front layer sinus, but you know what? Many a times, spinoid ridge as well as clinoid has got the air sinuses as well in there. Uh, once in a while, you do come across these patients. So I try not to use drill as much as possible and use a small nibbler or kerosene punches. And if you do use a drill, even for clinoid, I think probably I would prefer to use a cutting drill slowly rather than using a diamond drill, simply because the risk of aerosol generation is higher in the diamond drill. But I think overall, in the whole wide scheme of things, the risk of using drill and aerosol spread is probably overestimated than it is. That's my view on it. I don't have a huge experience, but that's my view on it. Yeah, Dr. Anna from Italy has, uh, has a question that if, if a patient needs an ICU and uh, admission and COVID has not been excluded, uh, to which ICU you will admit the patient? And COVID or non-COVID? <laughs> no, we usually, if it's a neurosurgical patient who requires neurosurgical treatment, uh, we will admit them in the, in the neurosurgical ITU. But again, if the number of patients either in neurosurgery or in COVID, uh, if they increase or they are disproportionate, our boundaries between ITUs are, can be quite blurred very easily. Uh, so we are quite flexible in that way. But uh, if a patient requires neurosurgical management, uh, we would prefer to admit the patient in a neurosurgical ITU. Anas, we yeah. have a holding ICU. We have a holding 
holding ward. We have a holding ward for children. So the patients go to the holding ward and holding eye soup till we get a swab test. So the patient for 24 hours at least remains in a wing, which is a different air, a, air handling unit, has a different air handling unit. And is a separate ICU because the PPE is different. The PPE for the uh, healthcare workers is much uh, higher, uh, you know, kind of the protection there. So these are all considered at positive COVID positive uh, till the test comes. So they are always uh, now because we also had the same problem. But fortunately in Mumbai, we are allowed to do uh, the, the, we had a direct discussion with the municipal commissioner and we had the possibility of doing all patients getting admitted uh, for a swab test. And Dr. Koshik has asked, do we have to take a, a consent that the morbidity and mortality will be higher in uh, this pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic. So do we have to take a special consent from patients when, whenever we are operating? Well, uh, I we have do. been, what, uh, what I've been doing since the lockdown began, uh, most of our patients are uh, uh, consent grade four. What it means is uh, if a patient is unconscious or requires emergency surgery in the UK, we do not have to take consent from the patient. The doctor has to sign the consent himself. So we do not have to take consent from unconscious patients or patients who are incapable of signing consent. And the facility, or not the facility, the practice of getting a relative to sign the consent doesn't exist in the UK. So either the patient signs a consent or the doctor signs a consent, which is called consent four. Uh, so, uh, and there are different rules for children and children who are above 16 as well. So we, we do not face that question, but uh, it is always a customary nowadays to to explain to the patients that yes, you are in a COVID environment and the risk of any treatment is likely to be higher, especially if they end up having developing a, a chest infection because of COVID. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's a question from Dr. Sudhir Dubey uh, is, uh, what is the outcome of patients uh, being operated who are COVID positive? 20% mortality in the literature published literature 20 percent mortality from covid that's a published literature not our experience we haven't operated any single covid patient till now i i can tell you generally if in our hospital the patients who are admitted with covid symptoms irrespective of any other pathologies there is 25 percent mortality uh, just of the inpatient uh, who have got covid so what it means is if you require hospital admission and if you have a COVID, you got one in four chance of dying, irrespective of any other uh, uh, comorbidity. Okay, so that's very high. Eh? That's very, very high. That is very high, but that's the fact. I mean, uh, this was the statistics forwarded to our hospital by, by yesterday evening. So maybe, maybe you are, uh, I mean, I think the protocol is different in UK than us because you probably are admitting only very sick patients, COVID patients. And I think the less symptomatic or mildly symptomatic don't get to the hospital. Is that what it is? That could be one. And second thing is because we are a tertiary it's referral center. percent mortality is, I mean, unbelievably high. You know, it's no country has that kind of mortality. Yeah, uh, yes. Mortality, probably very sick patients. We, we got district general hospitals about eight or 10 in the region. And uh, we are a tertiary reference unit for all the neurosurgical or any emergencies. And we are a national unit for uh, stereotactic radio surgery. So yes, the patient case mix that we would be receiving and admitting in our hospitals probably would be different from uh, that in the peripheral hospital or in the community. So that could be one of the reasons that could reflect uh, uh, the high level of morbidity. Another thing, because uh, this uh, webinar is broadcast in India and Asian countries, I think one of the more startling features of our mortality figures is Asian and black community, uh, uh, so ethnic minorities. We have got at one stage, I remember uh, uh, last week when I inquired about out of 21 or 22 patients, almost 18 or 19 patients were from ethnic and black, black minorities. And this has been raised by the BMA as well. The British Medical Association has asked for a public inquiry into why ethnic minorities are more likely to need ICU and are more likely to suffer death from uh, the COVID infections. I don't have an answer for that, but yes, uh, to answer your question also, that our figures are also not reflective of what's happening in community. The uh, UK is an aging population and we got number of patients, elderly patients in the community in peripheries and nursing homes. 
and we are only recently starting getting the data of what's happening to them because uh, that's uh, another uh, Pandora's box, I think. So yes, the, the numbers could be a lot different uh, the, in, in the periphery and in the hospital. There's that... a question from Dr. Solanki. It's asked if one COVID test is negative, then it, it is valid for how many days to do surgery? Oh, we, we don't have that kind of uh, rule that because we, have, we didn't have a COVID test for patients. But if a COVID test is negative and the patient has no symptoms, so the patient is recovering, then probably we will not want to repeat a test the patient or the patient gets the worse. Way, basically, the COVID test, how many days validity you will give? Means the patient come, I have done a COVID test today, I come after one month for surgery. Is it <laughs> I don't valid? You could have developed COVID. Uh, in during that one month and not yet develop the symptoms. So Dr. Solanki has asked that how many days we can give, the, what is the validity of the test? Duration of validity. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I don't have so this is a protocol what we are following. I'll tell you what we are following for patients to have to come chronically back to the hospital. These are the medical oncology patients for chemotherapy sessions and dialysis patients. I mean, there is nothing. So we have just taken one uh, arbitrary figure because we feel the patient becomes symptomatic in five to seven days. Now, if the patient is tested today and he is negative, tomorrow the report has come. The first test and after seven days, these are only for patients who come for repeat treatment. That's what we are following right now for the dialysis patients, for the onco patients and for radiation oncology patients. Medical oncology and radiation will come for repeat treatment. So we are doing seven every seventh day one test. As I said, there is very little, you know, kind of evidence, but the logic behind it is five, seven days they become symptomatic. So if they're symptomatic, their trials, they don't get into us before we do a test. But if they're not symptomatic, they get a second test after seven days of the first test. That's what we are following now. Uh, I, I think uh, Basan you're right. And even if it's not evidence-based, it I think makes makes complete sense of what you're doing. And there's one thing good... There's no science. This is just common sense. Actually. Okay. Uh, but what, what good thing about you guys is because you have the ability to manage and make policies and protocols uh, to your, within your institutions as you feel appropriate. Unfortunately, we are in the NHS. We got to always follow the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the national guidance as well as local managerial guidance. And we do not have that kind of policy. We cannot make any kind of policy that what you said, unless we get an approval. No, no, no. It's not easy in India also. But we are fortunate because one of our directors has direct access to the municipal commissioner. See, health is a state subject in India. So every state, like Manas said, they are not allowed to do testing. In Maharashtra, they are allowing, there's a lot of you and cry. You know, the central minister saying that you cannot test it. And there is some lot of, a lot of differences. So we explain to them that by doing a test, we are, we are helping not to close down the hospital. Now, suppose 10 patients and 10 healthcare workers come positive, we have to close down it. So it becomes a red zone. So we, are, we don't want to do that. So they have allowed it. So, but there is a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. Like Mana said, I'm told that they are not allowed to do it. Yeah, Dr. No, Madhukar from Karnataka, he has asked that uh, when we, they are also not allowed to do COVID-19 test. So whether a CT test, will help. And the second thing is, Ajit, if you cannot do COVID-19, then should we use this uh, PAPI, like powered air purifying respirator for all cases? Uh, is it uh, feasible in India, where COVID-19 is not, 19 is not allowed? What is your comment, Dr. Deepak and Dr. Mishra? See, Both from a public it's hospital it's and a private hospital. One, it's not available in places where they don't have the other facilities. It's not easy to get proper PPE. So, PP in yes. India, a lot of PPEs are going around, but what is the yes. proper PP? Nobody, you know, has that, and very few have that proper. Like 3M, you ask 3M, everybody is sending that uh, the the N95, but it's not 3M N95. You know, there are local N95 which does not give that 95% protection which N95 is supposed to give. So that's a problem. But treat everything as if you cannot do a test today, everybody is a suspect, and you have to take as much precautions as you can. Yeah, Dr. Deepak. Yeah, I'm working in uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, which is the premier institute. In fact, Dr. B.K. Mishra was earlier working here. And uh, see, uh, in most of the centers in our country, no matter whether it's a, uh, I'm talking about the public sector, 
uh, we don't have enough uh, facilities to do this uh, COVID testing. So as a matter of policy in our hospital, we presume every patient as COVID suspect. And uh, we take all the precautions and uh, the level two and the level three uh, PPE kits, which are available, we use them. And having said that, we must understand uh, for a neurosurgeon, it's almost impossible to operate with uh, level three kits and uh, using your microscope. So, I mean, these are the things which we are going to face like most of the panelists uh, out here and the speakers. I too have not come across even a single positive COVID case on whom I have operated in the last one month. What we are doing is surgery on the COVID suspects only. And uh, regarding this test, uh, I think we have to follow the hospital policy. If I want to get my COVID test done, if I have a cough and uh, fever and other things, uh, I will have to take permission from a hospital authority. And if they are satisfied, then only we do it. So it's not easy to get the COVID test done for each and every patient every time in most of the centers. In Bombay, actually, anybody who has symptoms can be tested. That's not a problem because there's a lot of private labs that are testing. Problem is asymptomatic people, patient pre-op cases. And there is a lot of, with a lot of problem, a lot of fight, we have been able to do it now. So all in our hospital, we can do every pre-op patient, we can do it. But that's a big, big problem. You're right. I mean, there's a huge problem in India. You cannot do tests. And as, I, as Kishore said, they have only last week, NHS started doing it. They were also not doing it before. So everybody is, I mean, things are evolving every day. I think things are changing. But I think it is good if you can do it. it, it it's, a, it's a good thing. Well, I think I think uh, the best country you should take example from is uh, Germany and South Korea. South and in Korea. Germany, they started doing the test from day one. And how many tests? 250,000 tests on day one. And here in UK, after six weeks of lockdown or six weeks, we have just about reached 100,000 uh, tests in the country. So, uh, so you can see the difference and you can see how the graph is going as well. Yeah, uh, we are running short of time. Uh, we have lots of questions, but I just asked one last question and rest of the questions we'll send by email to all the speakers and panelists and we'll expect an answer and then we'll forward it to the uh, people who have asked. The last question is uh, by Dr. Ramesh Tigala. He has asked for how many months uh, we need to follow this protection. Six months, one year, three months. Nobody After knows. Lockdown. <laughs> I think that's the answer. Are you okay? Nobody knows. Huh? Nobody knows the answer. And that's A, B, C, D. See, three months, six months, one year. Uh, not, not, we don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody all, knows. all I could say is that from the history, uh, when there was uh, uh, the Spanish outbreak uh, in 1918, the second peak of the disease killed a hell of a lot more patients than the first peak. So I don't think we are finished with COVID or we will be finished with COVID for a foreseeable future. Our lives and practices as neurosurgeons are going to change, have changed, and the sooner we come to terms with it, the easier it will be for us and for our patients. Yeah, Dr. Deepak. Uh... Yeah, actually, I think uh, we will see more and more patients in coming months. Uh, and in fact, uh, once the lockdown opens up, uh, more and more patients are likely to come. So the actual neurosurgery burden of COVID positive patients is yet to be encountered by most of us, I would say. Regarding Ramesh questions, I, I, I think uh, we will have to take all the standard uh, precautions and treat every patient as a COVID suspect minimum of one year from now, for sure. And the last comment from Dr. Lee. Uh, how many months of uh, you think you'll follow the protocol at Wuhan? Pardon? Uh, how, how many? Or how many? How many months you will be hmm. following to we will be continuing to do COVID testing and take all the precautions in your hospital. <laughs> I, I, I have a, a lot of problem about my... Uh, we have the uh, protective, uh, only the uh, general uh, on your first uh, level for now. May we uh, build, uh, establish the buffer area uh, in the next in the uh, one month uh, from March. Uh, we will continue it, uh, but we uh, more than less than more than twenty days. Twenty days. There is not one COVID nineteen 
patient, new uh, patient, 19 patient have been reported in our city. Okay. So uh, we have, uh, uh, the, my city have re, re week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And uh, before I conclude, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mishra, Dr. Sinha, Dr. Choudhury, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Gupta uh, for spending the evening in uh, and discussing a very important subject with many young neurosurgeons who are practicing, especially in the uh, smaller cities. They are confused to start practice or not. And this would be very useful for them. And uh, I thank all of you. And uh, uh, good night and stay safe. And uh, Help your patients and be safe also. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. It's my pleasure. Uh, Pastor Vesh. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Sriram from Icon Pharmaceuticals Good. for coordinating the event. The mask is the youth view and wash hands is youth view too. <laughs> Social distance is important. Thank we, you. Uh, in our uh, experience, it's youth view. Yeah. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good luck. Bye. 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 Bye.